I, I was curious about something because I, I don't know <laughs> what your experience was like with this. How much input did you have into the cover of your books of the Godblind trilogy and, of course, maybe your new ones? Um, the go for, for Godblind, they, um, they sent me three potential mock-ups and I had absolutely no idea what I was, none at all what I was going to get. I was probably 70% convinced it was going to be a very traditional high fantasy cover. Right. Um, I thought there was probably, you know, there would either be, you know, a silhouette with a sword or, you know, like a cloaked figure or a battlefield or something like that. Um, and then they sent me these three, these three sort of related um, images for Godblind. And I just, my, my brain basically just leaked out of my ears because it was, <laughs> it was, they were so unique and unusual and completely not what I was expecting. Um, so I was obviously, I was absolutely over the moon. And then of course they had to keep that sort of aesthetic going for the other two books. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say probably, probably blood child. I had the most input to, cause we did by this, pardon me, by this time we were, um, trying to work out what animal we could put on the cover. Right. Um, and I remember one suggestion was a kraken and I was like, that's, brilliant but nobody goes to see so i don't really i'm not entirely sure if it's going to work or not um so then we settled on we settled on the cat and i was like right i need to work a cat into it um which is mild spoiler please mute me for the next sort of 15 seconds if you haven't read it um but that was why um tara um, Tara's stole animal is a cat oh. because I was like it needs to be somebody and I thought who kind of embodies like that sort of big fluffy kitty that can probably claw you to death um, <coughs> if need be and I just went yeah that's definitely Tara um, so yeah so that, that was how I chose that particular animal to be uh, the representative of, of Tara's spirit I think it's, it's a bit of a mystery to do with with covers on books and most people don't realize that as authors we're kind of we we have some input but we're mm. not we don't come up we don't go to the publisher and say i want a sword and a, and a this and a moon and it's a case of it's one of these things that i don't think people know about is what actually happens is they came i think in my first trilogy they, they asked me if there's anything i particularly wanted if i had any unique ideas because at this point you know any of the big publishers has done thousands of covers so they're always yeah. hoping for something unique so they asked me and I couldn't come up with anything uh, so they went away came up with some ideas um, I gave them one rule on my first trilogy that I said there's only one thing I don't want to see and they went oh what's that and I went because it's wizards I went I don't see a, a figure in the in the on, on the front cover in a hood no one in a hood on the front cover and they were like oh <laughs> Because it's the shorthand trope for fantasy, yeah. for assassins, for wizards, yeah. uh, mercenaries, I think, probably have men in hoods. Probably, yeah. Any kind of figure of mystery, hood. Um, so I banned them from doing that in the first trilogy, and they had to come up with something different. But it, it's, we don't dictate. They give us no, different no. designs and ask us for our opinion on them. And that's yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've heard a couple of authors say that they have a Pinterest board. And they mm. just send the link to their Pinterest board. And they're like, these are all of the pictures that I've been using as inspiration while I've been drafting the book, which I quite like the idea of. Um, but I really don't need another drain on my time. I don't need another excuse to not be writing. <laughs> not write. Because otherwise I would just be like, hmm, what? Sticking pictures. Ooh, what, ooh. Exactly. What picture of a bracelet perfectly encapsulates this character and then i would be on etsy for nine hours and i'd probably buy stuff that i don't want or need and then i'd be like that was a productive day wasn't it hannah <laughs> how many words have you written none <laughs> well thinking time mm. <laughs> on my new book that i didn't i only did a pinterest board 
when they asked for any covers that I particularly liked. So the one that's coming out next year, they said any that you particularly like, and I gave a bunch of us the, the feel for something a bit different. Okay. So that's the closest I've ever come, sort of saying something like this, and they went away and came back, and then um, the, the new book, will, the cover's going to be coming out fairly soon, I think, for next year. Um, so, it, and I was very happy with it because there again, it's not typical. I thought I was going to get something fairly typical, and I saw it. I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. And it's not what I was thinking, but it was oh, right. the mindset of what I'd suggested. Yeah, they sort of took the theme of it and said, okay, something a bit different, and that's and that's what we've got. What about the new one then with the stone knife? Where did that come from? The cover. Mm. Um, I mean, again, they were, they, they just kind of, as far as I'm aware, the editors just gave a brief to the art department. Right. Um, and, you know, so they sort of, they, they described the characters, they described the, uh, the sort of the landscape and the geography and the climate and, and stuff like that. Um, and they and they gave an overview, uh, and they came up with an idea which, in the end, we haven't gone with. Um, so I probably have had the most amount of input on this one um, because there were a couple of cultural connotations with the cover that they originally came up with, mm. and we didn't want to. Um, we didn't want to step on anyone's toes and we didn't want to be disrespectful. Um, so we sort of chatted it through and said, look, what's, what's the alternative? What could we do instead? Um, so they've sort of simplified the background, um, which is fine. And it's still really evocative and it still works really well. Um, and then they, you know, they've, they've sort of, They've given the font for the title, so for the, the stone knife, they've just they've used this this beautiful font and this this really great um, sort of color scheme on it, so that it actually looks really metallic and it looks like it would glint when you move it and stuff like that. Nice. Um, so it works really really well, uh, but I think um, I wonder whether that's because it's my second trilogy with the same publishers. So I, I, I wonder whether um, they're just more used to working with me. So that was why I got a little bit more input this time. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm really, really happy with the cover the way it is. I did like the original one, but um, it's just, we, we just wanted to play it safe in the end. And, and so that's why we made the changes that we did. Okay. So we talked about it a bit. So for those who don't know what it's about, and, it, and tell them when it comes out, because it's very soon, tell them what the book is about and when it's uh, coming. coming. Okay, uh, so it is The Stone Knife, uh, book one of Songs of the Drowned. It comes out on the 26th of November, um, which is just six weeks. About six weeks, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, about six weeks away. Don't um, panic. It, don't panic. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is um, the story of. It's similar in its way to the Goblin trilogy in that it's it's the story of a conquest, um, but it's got a much stronger focus on um, the evils of empire and colonization and how that can affect. Um, both the colonized and the colonizers and how it changes behavior among people and stuff like that. Uh, it's set in a very different world. Uh, so it's set in a jungle environment. Um, so I had to do a truly astonishing amount of research um, <laughs> in order to work out um, how, how societies actually live and function within uh, a rainforest um, and within that sort of geology and climate and things like that. Um, there is, there's various different types of magic. There is a sort of ancestor driven magic and there is also a song driven magic. Um, and there are um, also monsters. So for the first time I have kind of gone for both an overt type of magic right. um, and uh, some super creepy water dwelling um, monstrous entities. Mm. 
exciting. And there's a very good dog in it as well. There's, <laughs> a, there's actually a lot of dogs, but there is one very, very good dog. I hope they, they better all survive after what's happening earlier. I can't take it's, any This more is dog not the trauma. animals of Farthingwood. <laughs> I hope not. I just or I, is it? Oh no! Come on, come on! It's, it's, <gasps> in any book, you can kill as many people as you want in any film, but if you hurt the animal, people will complain about the animal. Oh yeah, oh, they'll yeah. be like, hundred people died, no one says anything, but they killed a the dog, and you're like, yeah, yeah. that's what they're going to remember. It's just going to. To be honest, it would just go full on John Wick if um, <laughs> if anything true. happened. <laughs> Oh, imagine John Wick in a fantasy world, like a fantasy book is all around someone's dog getting killed. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> mm. I wonder if I've got time to change the plot. <laughs> You're amazing. You're amazing. <laughs> just straps on all these knives and swords and stuff. Wow. Yes. Yes. Anyway, sorry, get, getting carried away now. So come on, what's your book? The new book? Mm. <laughs> okay. So it's out, it's out next June. I thought I was going to talk about it. Um, it's out next June. Um, it's a duology, and the, the second book will be out the following year. Um, and it's called The Coward uh, from Angry Robot okay. Books. Um, it's set in a world where... Ooh, bit, you all right? Yeah, I'm just trying to take my jacket off. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's set, in, it's set in a world <laughs> where um, a young boy aged 17... Um, he lives in this place called the Five Kingdoms and uh, the ice is creeping south, taking over the land and basically everyone's afraid that they're going to freeze to death. So they gather together this great group of heroes to go and vanquish the evil in the north. And he tags along as a plucky 70-year-old kid who's determined to prove that he's a hero. And he goes and everyone dies apart from him and he comes back. But they win, <laughs> okay. kind of. Okay. And then... He comes back and he's uh, got PTSD and he's shell shocked and he's a ruin of a man and he just lives a quiet life on a farm. And then 10 years later, something takes up residence in the north again and they're like, right, get Kel Cressier, take up his famous sword slayer, he'll go out and vanquish it again. And his response is, no, no, I've done that, I've been there, everyone died. They all died, and I watched them all die horribly. You want me to go and do it again? No. That's why the book's called The Coward. Lovely. And it's about his adventures <laughs> 10 years after the fact of him broad, being. Broad sense of the word adventure. <laughs> it is a quest book, to be fair. They both are. Um, very, very different. But yeah, this one is about, you know, heroism and the nature of heroism and what it means to be a hero and fame and uh, the price of fame and the price of being a legend and how people respect you in society and um, all sorts of stuff. Um, wow. But yeah, a very, Sounds excellent. a very, very different kind of story to anything I've done before. Um, and I broke all my own writing rules, but <laughs> we'll not get into that. No, no, no. No, no, I, I think we should. No, no, no. As soon as I just told you, you my, <laughs> my chaotic writing process. No, let's move on. Okay. <laughs> I, saw, I saw this, this. I'd like you to comment on it, actually. I saw this yeah. as recently as last week on Twitter. Somebody said, and I, and I, and I, and I quote, do I need to have finished the book? the first draft of my book, before I query an agent. This is a fiction novel. Your, your thoughts, please. My overriding instinct is yes. With fiction? Um, I know, uh, I'm pretty sure that Scott Lynch got his five book deal on the basis of a partial. Um, so he'd written like a quarter of the lives of Lock Ramora. And... Uh, Galanks were like, yes, please. Um, but but I would say that he is very much the the outlier that that proves one that, in a million. Yeah, very much. An very actual much. million, though, not just like oh, <laughs> we're saying that. No, no, yeah. he's one in an actual million submissions. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I would say definitely finish your first draft because um, if you're anything like me you're just going to end up rewriting it and changing at least 40% of the story anyway, and that will make it better. 
Um, but also the other thing is that people, people kind of hit the 10 to 15,000 word mark and they think, Oh, I'm far enough in. I'm just going to, I'm just, I've had this idea for the opening. I'm just going to go back and tweak it. And then they tweak 10 to 15,000 words and then they go, no, no, what would be even better? And they go back mm -hmm. and they do it again. And I did that myself for years before I ever finished the first draft of Goblind. Um, I rewrote probably the opening 10, 15,000 words five, six, seven, eight times. Um, because you just get stuck and you think once I've got the perfect start, the rest of the book will, will flow. And it, it doesn't, you know, if you really need to change the opening, you make a note in the margin or on a post-it note or wherever you keep stuff like that. And you keep going. And then when you've got to the end, then you can go back. Mm -hmm. But I, I would always say finish your first draft. And the thing is, even once you finish the book and even once you hand it into an agent, you then spend months, years working on it with your agent to get it ready for, for before they say it's ready to go to a publisher. And then once it goes to a publisher, you then work on it again, several times, several drafts and through different stages. So I, I saw that and I, I just that gif of someone banging their head through the wall. I, I was, <laughs> not, not just against it through the wall. I was like... <laughs> Yeah, I, I just, I, I despair yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Ugh. Because also, your agent needs to know that you can finish a book. They yeah. don't want to, they don't want to invest time and effort into you. And then you get to 50,000 words and run out of steam. Um, and a publisher certainly doesn't ever want to get to that stage. So they need to know. I mean, I think as well, that's why they like having... A synopsis for a whole trilogy or, or however long your series is is they want to know that you've got enough ideas to get all the way through i mean with with my new series um the first synopsis that i sent into my agent he said this is a duology not a trilogy interesting and so i went and wrote an entire book's worth of synopsis because i don't know how to write duologies they frighten me <laughs> I don't understand how, where you split the story. I can understand a three act play or a three book trilogy. I, mm -hmm. I don't, I, it's like, do you take the first half of the second book and jam it on the end of the first book? And then on the front of the second, what, how does that work? Just write three books. It's, it's easier. Um, so yeah. So, so instead of just going, okay, I'll write a duology. I just wrote an extra plot. <laughs> okay as you do you know as you do i was yeah. just like right what else can i jam in there <laughs> yeah okay yeah so you must you must must finish the book so yeah speaking of, of of bad advice what's the worst piece of writing advice you've ever been given um okay uh so i was out um what stage was I was at? So I was at, I was editing with Harper Voyager. I was editing Godblind. So this was before I'd actually been published. Yeah. Um, and me and my husband, we went out with some family friends. Um, and it was the first time we had met our friend's new girlfriend. Um, and she was a painter, an artist. And I was chatting to them about the process of editing. Um, and she just looked at me and she said, you let them change your book. And I said, uh, I'm sorry, I, what, I don't understand. What do you mean? I, do I let them change my book? I said, they're, they're the professionals. They know, um, they know what they're talking about. They, they know how to, how to tease out the shape of the book that I'm trying to write, the story that I'm trying to tell. And she said, if anyone came up to me when I was painting and told me that I should change the way I paint, I would tell them that they can just do one because how dare they interrupt my art and how dare they tell me how I should create. That's not art. You're just selling yourself for a book contract. And I was like, okay. So when she woke up a week later in a coma, <laughs> you were there going, hello. I mean, I was... <laughs> I, 
I was very proud of myself actually because I wasn't quite petty enough to ask how many paintings she'd stole, sold. Um, so I just said, well, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's everyone's opinion. At the end of the day, I'm learning from my editor. And, you know, did you go to art school? It turns out she didn't go to art school. Um, which is fine. Not all artists do. I have nothing against artists, just this one in particular. Fair enough, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that was quite... And because I was, I was still in, like, the giddy with excitement phase of the whole thing, mm. um, that one was pretty crushing. But... Um, and so that's why it has, that's why it has stuck with me. She did later fall over and bang her head though, which I. <laughs> you laughed. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> karma has a bitch. It just, it just felt like karma. It just really it. did. It really karma did. Karma is a bitch. Sometimes yeah. she comes around and just bites you in the ass and sometimes she trips you over. Anyway. So yeah, so that one, that one has always really stuck with me. Um. <laughs> Other than that, I don't think there's been any sort of real clangers. Mm. Whatever works for you, you know, there's, there's not really any hard or fast rules, I don't think, apart from potentially finish your first draft. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So we've got some questions from the audience. We've had some people come and write in. Oh, uh, no. It's all right. Don't worry. Not, there's nothing too shocking, really. <laughs> uh, uh, Patrick asks... He said, which uh, series have, have you enjoyed writing more? God Blind or, or The Stone Knife? Because um, it's, it's different. Because when yeah. you're doing that first trilogy, everything's all about trying to get the agent and doing it. And this second time round, it's a different thing. You know more about publishing. You know more about the process. You know about, more about the edits. But equally, you're starting a brand new world and it took you a long time to yeah. write that first series. The first book took you a long time and you built it yeah. up. Now it's like, do all of that again in less time. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. just as good or better. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, they're both absolute labours of love. Um, I would never write anything that I wasn't, you know, 100% committed to. Um, I've had to do an awful lot more research for Songs of the Drowned. Um, so that has been quite a new challenge for me, um, as I, I tended to, I sort of dived into a couple of research books, made a load of notes, started writing, but carried on reading the research at the same time. So every time I came across a really cool fact, I was like, oh, I need to slot that in. And then I would kind of like just knit back and just like jam it in somewhere. Um, Hence, again, why I have to rewrite so much of my work. Um, I think I've, I've been more ambitious with this series. Um, right. I've, I've taken on some bigger topics, um, which I've had sort of a lot of crises of confidence around whether I should be doing this, whether I'm good enough to actually get across what it is I'm trying to say. Um, so it's been, it's been emotionally quite difficult in that sense. Um, but I am really proud of the book that I've, that I've written. Um, I, I don't think it can come down to something as simple as, as like, as, as in which one I've enjoyed. Mm -hmm. They've both been completely different, um, situations, you know, writing Godblind 13 years, writing the stone knife eight months for the first draft. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, I, I worked out, uh, I had a little Facebook memory pop up from um, August 2018. Mm -hmm. And it was me and my husband in a pub in London um, during the Nine Worlds conference. Uh, right, convention. Yeah, yeah, convention, yeah. And, um, and I showed it to him and he said, that was the day you told me your idea for the stone knife. And, ah. and it, it was just, it was really nice because we actually got a photo of it and it was, it was in that pub at that point, mildly tipsy that I <laughs> blathered on about the, uh, the idea for a new series. 
So it was only two years ago. And wow. it's, you know, it's out in six weeks. So it has been a really fast process, um, which has been, everything has been quite heightened. Um, so Patrick, I'm really sorry. I, I can't answer. I love them both. <laughs> Fair it was enough. a really rambling way to say <laughs> I have no answer. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be okay with that. I'm, I'm answering for him. Anyway, that's fine. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Bethan has asked, he said, you've expressed an interest in writing for the gaming industry in the past. Mm. Is there any particular series of games you'd love to be involved in? I assume she means in writing, writing for that, that game franchise. See, Bethan is evil because she knows <laughs> I don't actually do a lot of gaming um, and just to say D&D &D is just like the easy answer um, but you know I mean a, a good D&D &D novel that is just like full of fun and ridiculousness um, would be a lot of fun to write um, I'm, trying to think, I'm trying to think what I used to play a lot of Snakes and ladders. <laughs> <laughs> Hardcore. You know what? There could be a story in that. Who let all the snakes out? Mm -hmm. And and who greased all the ladders? You know, I mean, there's there's a there's a lot going on in snakes and ladders, man. Well, I, I think someone beat you to it. I think Robert Jordan did it in the Wheel of Time because he has <laughs> he has foxes. I'm not kidding. He has foxes and snake men, and it goes back to this ancient game. And I, when I was reading it 20 years ago, I went. Hang on, snakes and ladders. I got foxes and snakes. <laughs> what? And I'm sh I, mean, I never got to the end of the Wheel of Time because it did take forever and there's like, 16 books. But back then, reading it at the time, I just thought, wow, weird. <laughs> Scraping the barrel. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd write for something like um, Fallout, which is a great kind of mm. post apocalyptic or. Um, the Witcher games because they're amazing. Uh, the side quests on some of those, on some of that, like The Witcher Three, are fantastic. There's so many cool missions you get to do, and have, like nothing to do with the overall plot, but yeah. they're so so cool. Like it could almost be like a short story from one of his books, and probably some of them were from you yeah. know, early books. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have I have played some uh, Dragon Age Origins um, mm. until I got to this one place and I just literally got killed over and over and over. And I can't fucking work it out. I cannot <laughs> survive. Like, every single one of my characters is just like, dead, 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 dead. I'm like, how? <laughs> it's like, over and over. So I've, I've kind of just given up for a while on that. Um, but I do like... I like all the snark and stuff like that in uh, in Dragon Age. So, mm. but I'm pretty sure there is actually Dragon Age books out there. Maybe is there? Maybe. Maybe. Mm. But um, as that's the only one that I've ever spent like a significant amount of time playing. Yeah. Um, I'd probably have to say that or D and D. Okay. Um, she also asked, um, you you had your kind of perfect cast for the Godblind trilogy if it got adapted. Do you have any thoughts on uh, a cast for the Stone Knight? Sean Bean, get killed in the first like chapter. You know? <laughs> Anybody die in chapter one? Can it be Sean Bean? What do you mean no? What? He's always available to die. Come on, what? No. Yeah. Typecast, what? I know, I know. That, I mean, that does, that does remind me of, um, you know, the, the whole untamed on Netflix, The Untamed Phenomenon, the Chinese drama. Yes. There's, a, there's an actor called Wang Haoshuan um, who plays a character in that um, who gets his arm cut off. Right. And I've, just, I, and, and I've just finished watching another Chinese drama called Dance of the Phoenix, which stars Wang Haoshuan, oh. who got his arm cut off. <laughs> and he was like, <laughs> literally, it was the same arm. And I was it's like, the new oh. Sean Bean all over again. <laughs> it's the tiny Sean Bean. It's, it's <laughs> such a shame. Um, does he actually have two arms in real life? Or, or is that just because they... Oh, no, he does. He does. Uh, okay, just checking. <laughs> but but um, the, the production values in some Chinese dramas aren't like particularly high. So you can, you can, you can kind of see that it's <laughs> like that quite a lot. Um, 
so it's, yeah it's quite funny oh wow okay so you, he'd definitely be in your cast then for the stone knife somewhere yeah i mean possibly possibly do i have anyone who loses an arm i mean i can i can write it specifically for him definitely yeah. Yeah. um but other than that i actually haven't really thought maybe um oh daisy da is it daisy ridloff I'm not sure quite what her name is, um, but she is um, she's a mixed race actress and she's deaf. And one of my main characters is is a deaf woman, um, so she would be great. She's she's going to be in an, in the Marvel Eternals movie. Yes, that's right. Yes, I can't I can't remember her exact um, her exact name. It's something like Ridloff. Someone will tell us in the comments. Something like that. Um, so yeah, so maybe her. Um, she see, she was in The Walking Dead, and she was, uh, which I gave up watching a long time ago. But yeah, I kind of caught a couple of episodes with her, and then she seemed super cool. So that's probably about as far as I've got at the moment. People have to read the book and then cast it themselves, I guess. Precisely. You know, yeah. uh, and also once you finish the trilogy, you might have a better idea as well of you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I did, um, I did an interview on the Fantasy Hive and, and one of their questions was, who, who, who's your dream cast for the Goblin trilogy? And I literally had like a dozen names <laughs> and reasons why for every single one of them. I was like, well, da, 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 da. Um, wow. so I'm sure that will probably develop over time. But, um, but at the moment, apart from Daisy, um, if it is Daisy, sorry actress lady um, <laughs> but but uh that's as far as i've got so far fair enough fair enough so six weeks to go till the stone knife uh until then where can people find you online uh okay um my website is anna-stevens.com uh stevens with a ph my Twitter and Instagram are both Anna Smith writes. Um, and I'm also on Patreon as Anna Stevens word seeker. Um, so I've got sort of regular content on there. Yeah. Um, like monthly updates. Um, so I do a monthly sort of like general update and then I do um, editing specific update and then uh the third tier is uh original fiction so that might be short stories set in the goblin universe um or just any other weird um places that come into my head at, at any point um so if you want to know like origin stories for um goblin characters and stuff like that then uh, that's in the original fiction on my patreon okay well i'll, I'll put some links in down below so people can can check them out as well cool. but uh i guess i guess that's it for tonight so thank you for joining me for another thank late night much. chat late night chat with the gin <laughs> and the vodka nearly out nearly out <laughs> <laughs> need a refill steve <laughs> yeah better go and get that anyway right <laughs> good night everyone brilliant thanks a lot bye